Well, good morning and welcome to FBC. My name is Gracie. And I'm Chris. And we are so glad that you've joined us. If this is your first time and you're watching online, we would love to connect with you. Click the links in the description. Let us know who you are, um, how we can be praying for you, all the fun things. And if you are in the building, as always, welcome. Uh, there are QR codes all over the place. Pick, pick your phone, pick your phone up scan that code um, it will take you to our church center app where you can find all the events all the things we'd love to be praying for you if you're interested in baptism all of that mm. is right there at your fingertips so scan that um, and there's also connect cards in the seat backs in front of you so take one of those fill it out and we would love to hear from you yeah Good. That was good. All the events. All of the events. Well, most of them for the summer are done, but there's still one more there happening. There's one more tomorrow. It's our tomorrow. <laughs> we are so excited. And actually, our Windshape staff is here Woo-hoo. on campus today. So if you see them walking around, please just give them a little word of encouragement. Thank How them will we for know being it's them? here. They will have their Windshape shirt on. I wish that makes that, sense. Yeah, it's a yeah. nice little polo. They thought that through. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So um, again, thank you, Windshape team, for being with us. We are so excited about camp. If you have have a camper um the ages we we still so sad news first um our completed kindergarten slots are still full and there is a wait list but if you still have a camper that has not registered completed first grade through eighth there is still room and we would love to have you at camp so again all that information is on the church center app um, and we are always here if you have any questions and still have financial assistance yep. if that is something we do not want that to be a reason that your child can't come to camp so it's happening find them windshape staffers encourage them they're yeah. like on the brink between super excited for another week of camp but also they've done a whole bunch of camp so they're it's, kind of I mean, like it's tiring. they're exhausted it's, super excited right they're kind yeah. of the, that person walking around it's a state it's of like delirium. a new parent sort of look <laughs> Yeah, that's what they look like. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Not yes. that I, yeah. Anyway. Not that you're cool. Man, you're anyway. about to be a new parent. Yeah. Again. So exciting. That's yeah, fun times. Yeah. And we've got something else coming up real soon that people need to sign up for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the summer a lot of groups that were summer specific for the season, um, those are wrapping up, those are coming to an end, which means that a lot of new fall classes, uh, a lot of fall small groups, those will be starting. Got a lot of groups that are relaunching, which is a lot of fun, uh, that haven't met maybe for a few semesters. Uh, some new classes, new groups for different demographics. Um, so a lot of a lot of really cool things. And one of those is re-engage. And so that's a, uh, a group that meets, this is for married couples, but this is for people, Marriage is going great. Maybe we're in a rough spot. Either one and everyone in between. Reengage yeah. is specifically for you. Have heard fantastic things from people that have gone through Reengage. They often come back and they're a, a leader for Reengage, and so yeah, uh, really it's a great. great program for for married couples. Uh, a group, a small group environment for for married couples specifically. Yeah. So that'll be on Sunday evenings at five o'clock. And that starts on August 21st. Yes, August and that is 21st. something to register for. So yes, again, it's on the Church register. Center app. Go there, register for that. Um, and like Chris said, there's also other groups starting. And so if you're looking for a small group, yep. please let us know. We would love to get you connected. I know Chris leads one. I lead one. So many amazing groups in the church. So Not just for kids and teenagers. Right, <laughs> right. right. yes. We, Outside of that. We are also personally developing our own walks in Christ. So. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. We'd love for you to join us yes. in that. We'd love for you to join it's us. It's great. It's important. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Good. All right. Continue our series. We're, we're coming up on the the, the home stretch of this First Corinthians yeah. journey. Uh, it's been a fun one since January. And so last week uh, in First Corinthians, Paul addressed uh, the topics of, of prophecy and gifts and tongues and how people were using those gifts in order to draw attention to themselves, how that's not an appropriate way to use the gifts. Right. And um, I've heard from many people that they appreciated the way that Bruce uh, discussed gifts and things like that that typically are maybe not addressed well or just not addressed at all. And yeah. so I'm just, I loved it. If you haven't seen it, go back and listen to it. You can you can find that on our uh, Facebook page. I, it's a worth a listen, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then this week, keep going. First Corinthians. We're continuing yeah. on. Shocker. And uh, we're going to be talking about order in worship. Not order of worship. Paul didn't really care about the order of your worship. <laughs> but order in worship, why that's important, what it means for the body. Um, so that, again, the attention thing, attention is directed towards the glory of God, not on making us draw attention to us. Right? Yeah. So it's going to be good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. 
Well, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're excited to get to worship with you. school kids are going to be here for Windshape Camp during the day. My kids are going to be there, so good luck. <laughs> so we're excited about that. It's going to be awesome, and thank you all so much uh, for being here today. Well, uh, hey, if you're a guest today, we would like you to do us a small favor. In the seat backs in front of you, there are connect cards, and uh, that's a way for you to just give us like an email address or a phone number. It's a way for us to get in touch with you this week. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about how your visit was, tell you about ways that you can get connected with the church and all, uh, answer any questions you have, all that kind of stuff. If you're watching online, there's a link in the description that will go to a virtual connect card. You can use that as well. There are also prayer request cards in the seat backs if you have anything you would like us to pray for. Our church believes in the power of prayer and our staff prays for every single prayer request that we get each week. So don't hesitate to fill that out so that we can pray for you. And at the end of the service, as you exit, there are drop boxes in the wall on either sides of the doors, and you can drop those cards right in there. Well, we get to do a fun thing today, we get to celebrate something, and Bruce is going to come tell you about that. Well, today we get to do something that's actually been delayed for several weeks because when you are a student pastor, you're at camp and you're on mission trips, you're doing all kinds of things. So we had to figure out a time when Chris was going to be here because he's just completed five years as our student pastor. And we, yeah. So we try to make sure we honor people when they have faithfully served our church for some time. And it's interesting because Chris came to be our junior high minister, our middle school minister many years ago, and very quickly was in a position to become our student pastor over everything we do with middle school and high school students in college. And I have to tell you, I've watched that for these five years and every time there's a challenge, Chris has stepped up. And the next challenge, he stepped up. And over the last few months, several times he has led worship in this room and preached for me. And every time I come back, that affirmation grows and that confidence grows. And so it's been really fun to watch him as he has stepped up to the plate time after time to show faithfulness. If there was one word I would give for Chris, it would be that steadiness that we can count on at all times. The Bible says that kind of workman is worthy of praise. And so today, I wanted to ask you to join me as we congratulate him and affirm him for those five years. Would you give him your thanks? Ten will be even better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Chris and for Lauren and your providence in bringing them to us for the chance to watch uh, his gifts flourish and his love for our students grow year by year and relationship by relationship. Father, we ask that you would multiply his years, that you continue to grow his gifts as he proclaims your word, as he loves in the name of Jesus, as he spends his resources and time and gifts to lead people to know you. And so God, affirm him today as we give thanks for what you've done through him and in him in these years. And we ask for many, many more to come. So now, as we lift our voices to you, as we turn our hearts to you in trust and in praise, and we thank this faithful servant, God, we pray for you to fill this place with your spirit, that it might be absolutely 
crystal clear to us that you've come to be a part of our time today. We give you the honor for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all, let's stand up. Let's sing.
Amen.
spoke a word You were singing over me You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so
heads together. Heavenly Father, this morning, I want to express how grateful I am for that love. It's a love that seems reckless to us because there's nothing promised in return from our end. It's a love with risk. A love that would be so hard for us to give to another person. A love that costs us. That's the kind of love that you give us, God. A love that is so big and so vast. We can never measure it. We can never comprehend it. But God, I pray today that we would pursue it. that we would not take it for granted, that we would not cast it aside as if it's worth nothing. God, in spite of our rebelliousness, in spite of our tendency to give ourselves into our own sinful nature, to give ourselves over to our culture, you still come after us with that love, God. learn to receive that love. And the way we know that we have received it is that it comes overflowing out of us into those around us. Let us have that kind of love today. God, as we prepare our hearts to hear from you, pray that we re remember that because of your love, you deserve our attention you deserve our worship. You deserve our lives. You deserve our love because you first loved us. God, let us hear from you today from a position of repentance, from a position of awe at the greatness of your love. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I will never get tired of hearing the stories of how Jesus found us. Every one of us have a different one. We have a context. We have a story. We have a past. We have certain things that were hard for us, certain things that were difficult to understand. There were certain barriers we had to work through. It's part of our story. It becomes part of what we call our testimony. And every single one of us have them. And it's always amazing how we think ours is unique. And yet, as we hear other people's stories, there's this point where you start going, this sounds familiar. It's like watching a movie you've already seen and forgotten, and you get to a certain point and you go, wait a second, we've seen this before. We've heard this before. And there are going to be some aspects about this morning, I think, where you'll say the same thing. Because those stories, even though they're vastly different the contexts are all different. We all have one. And there are certain things about following Christ that our own experience make more difficult or harder to understand. And that was true 2,000 years ago in a little town called Corinth. We've been talking and teaching through 1 Corinthians for some time. And we often look at the, the record of their experience as one of the longest records in the New Testament writings. And it's not because they were stellar or exemplar. It was because they were a hot mess. I mean, everything about what they experienced, there were so many problems that it took a long time for Paul to start addressing those. And so today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 14. We've been 
13 and a half chapters into this. And last week we talked about part of their problem, that they had been exercising their spiritual gifts with arrogance, like theirs was better than somebody else's. And it was almost like a culture of one upmanship or what I call my dog is bigger, that kind of, of argument. But they were trying to come into following Christ with all this baggage, their arrogance, their arguments, their own cultural setting, the immorality. It was so much a part of that. And Paul is trying to help them see that following Christ and that experience is going to be different from what they have always grown up with and now have been rescued from. So in chapter 14, last week we were talking about how they saw their own gifts with arrogance and they tried to compare that with each other. And Paul has said, look, you have come out of this passionate culture where you love the supernatural. You love the stuff that really garners attention. And it's not that those gifts are bad, but they have to be in their right context. And so he's called them to task saying, it is more valuable to have something that's, that's sensible, something that can make sense and people can understand than that you demonstrate your gift even though nobody understands it. That was what was going on up until this time. Their context was so different from following Christ that they didn't even know how to worship together. It was so confusing. Paul finally gets to this point where he's trying to help them understand how to worship together. And I want you to understand the context of this is really important. In this passionate but often unhealthy church, even how they worshiped was a cacophony of noise and disorder. It made no sense. And so he gets very practical in a way I think you'll feel like, gosh, that's overly simplistic. Give it a minute. Let's see. He says, this is starting in verse 26. He says, well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. He goes on. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Let two or three people prophesy and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. For God, this is so important, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's people. Now, this whole discussion may feel odd. You may be looking at this and saying, this, you would think this would make sense. You go one at a time, you share that, you're courteous, you wait for each other. But this culture is so absolutely foreign to us it's hard to grasp it so just real quickly remind you Corinth was a town where the culture was upside down from what Jewish culture was Paul is talking to people who haven't grown up in synagogue they haven't gone to Torah school they don't know what God has done in the past what they know is they have heard of Jesus and seen that power demonstrated very clearly but they still don't understand his heart. They're still just putting the pieces together. They've experienced him. They've trusted him. They've experienced the Holy Spirit. But there's so much unanswered. At the same time, you have to think of where they're coming from. The city of Corinth was full of idolatrous cults. Almost all of them were what we call fertility cults. And instead of having a priest who told the truth, you had a priestess that served as a temple prostitute. Fertility cult, the priestess. Everything was wild. It was immoral. It was the more confusing, the more lascivious, the more disorderly, the better. 
It was all about passion. And Paul comes and he's trying to help them understand passion does not measure up to truth because you can be passionately wrong. The truth is what matters. And that's why he's saying you are so enamored with this ecstatic utterance of speaking in tongues. Prophecy is about forth telling, telling the truth. I would rather you have the ability to hear the truth than hear something that garners your attention, but you can't understand. That's been the argument. But they were coming at worship from a completely different mindset and background. And frankly, they didn't know what to do. So they talked over each other. They spent all kinds of time trying to outdo one another. Now, you may have come from families that are like that. Kelly and I have acquaintances where whenever you're with them, nobody takes turns. They talk at each other and over each other all the time. It's almost like watching a tennis match where both people are trying to serve at the same time. And I find myself literally and sarcastically, I admit, when people are talking at the same time and they're tr both trying to tell me the same story where I literally go, I'm sorry, who, who's talking here? Or the game I've started playing in the last few years, I have some friends who have no idea how to stop talking. They have what I call running mouth disease. <laughs> so here's my game. I have a timer on my phone. So when it starts and I realize this is going to be a while, I just hit the timer. The record is an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> where all I do, my only response is this. Mmm. 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 Never open my mouth. Never say a word. Mmm. Mmm. Hour and 15 minutes. And I'm not rude enough, although I want to be, to say, Do you ever take a breath? That's what they're doing in worship. They're all trying to prophesy. They're all trying to speak in tongues. They're all trying to do this stuff. And it's like, Paul would say, You're giving a migraine to me. This is not what this is about. But that was exactly what happened in the temples when they are drinking to excess and they're visiting the temple uh, prophetess or priestess. It was all this mix, this mess. And the problem is they're bringing the Corinthian culture into the church instead of allowing the church of Jesus Christ to penetrate the culture those values to penetrate the nooks and crannies of their city. And so Paul comes along and he's, he's being very simplistic because they literally do not know how to operate. And this is why for months we've been saying to you that context is everything. It's shaping the entire letter and these chapters in particular. This all is coming out of the problems they were experiencing as a church. That they weren't listening to each other. They weren't taking turns. They weren't treating each other with respect. There was tolerance, intolerance for each other. There was arrogance about their own gifts. On and on it goes. And so Paul comes and says, let me give you some practical advice. Think about this. Go one at a time. Now that's deep, Right? I mean, you hear that and go, that, that just seems like it was obvious. It wasn't. There was no courtesy for each other. When, when Chris was preaching about the Lord's Supper a few weeks ago, and part of that that we read was they wouldn't wait for each other. Literally, what was supposed to be this holy moment of fellowship with one another to remember Christ's death and resurrection, they were turning into gluttony and drunkenness. Yeah, we had a great Lord's Supper last night. It was that kind of deal. They weren't waiting for each other. Second, he says this, limit the number of those who will teach or speak or lead. Because everybody went, no, we're going to put some parenthesis on this. We're going to frame this, bracket this. There's a limit to what we're going to do at one time. And the last, this is this, don't allow the same disorder that was part of the wild fertility cult settings to shape the meetings of the church. Because that's what was happening. Now we hear this and, and I just have to remind you. This was not an institutional church. This was not a body that had organized and had lots of history. They had, none of them had been to synagogue. They didn't know what that looked like. 
And so they were trying to figure out how to be the body of Jesus with each other. Now, I want to give you a context for that that may help. I want you to imagine not this, but a dinner party at your house. I want you to imagine that you have 12, 16, 20 people in your home. And you've decided to have a dinner party. You ever notice that if you have multiple tables, because almost none of us have a table for 16. In our house, we have two where we can have eight people seated. And often, if we have a dinner party at our house, at some point, one table is, hey, can y'all keep it down? We can't hear each other. You know that kind of dinner party? You're laughing, you're telling stories, some of which are actually true. You're eating really great food. You're having a great time with your friends. Now imagine that is the context for what we call the church. You've gathered together, because it's not a formal thing. It's not this organized thing. It's just you've experienced Jesus, and you're trying to figure out, what is it like to walk with him? That was the church in Corinth. And so they have more question marks than exclamation points. They're just trying to figure this out. Now contrast that with today. For the last three weeks, our team has been thinking about today. Just like we've been thinking about next week and the next. And our team comes together and we talk about the scripture and we talk about what kinds of ideas would help you grab that. We also are very aware of attention span. You don't have a four-hour attention span. If I was John Wesley living two and a half centuries ago, then you would listen to me drone on for four hours and thought nothing of it. <clears throat> Today, I still say we're in the Napoleon Dynamite attention span. About 160 seconds and you're done. We've got to move on, you know? Everything's instant. We multitask. We're doing all kinds of things. Right now, you're thinking about how many times your phone is buzzed. You're thinking about other things besides that. You're multitasking. Attention span is short. So we think through that. How do we create change to hold attention? Last week, I told you, Michael had read my notes from my study and said, hey, I just want to make a suggestion. Great. Or we'll think about music. We'll make a suggestion. Or we think about you kinesthetic learners that need to write something down. Some of you are taking notes. Some of you are doing that very actively. Some of you are visually oriented. And so what Ken does with graphics and pictures, and I have to remind myself, I'm an auditory learner. I hear and learn. Some of you are visual. And so I have to remember, hey, there are times when I really make, need to make that visual for you. We think, we pray, we plan. So we have this hour together and there's a movement and it's not that everything starts when I get up to talk, but that something has been happening in this room all along to teach and to guide and allow us to hear the truth. When that's done really, really well, I feel like I'm a baseball player getting up and all I have to do is bunt. That's a whole lot better than getting up and there's nobody in the base and we already have two outs and it's like, how do I swing all the way to the fence. It's different. So Paul comes along with this, this information to try and help them understand how do we lead people closer to Jesus that's centered on the truth. Now, there's a side story. There's sort of this aside that happens that Paul does here. And almost every time I have read this scripture, I know it's a distraction. But again, we go back to that culture where they weren't sure how to operate. We go back to a culture that was matriarchal, not patriarchal. It was upside down from what the biblical view was, from what God had, had revealed. And it was a situation where everything was just this hot mess, disorderly. So there's something that's happening here that leads Paul to write something that I think is some of the most provocative troubling stuff we read in this chapter. And I, I taught about this nine months ago, so I don't want to beat it to death, but it says women should be silent during the church meetings. It's not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive, just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home, for it's improper for women to speak in church meetings. Now we read that in the 21st century and we go, what in the world is he talking about? 
And so you do a little digging on the language and there's something I want you to see here that, that is really helpful to me. This isn't an admonition to never speak, but it is a statement about orderly worship in this chaotic culture. That was what was going on. It was chaos. And so one of the scholars I thought found something very interesting, G.P. Hugenberger, says this. The word be silent is translated in a lot of contexts Settle down. Now, in a world where everybody's speaking at the same time, settle down. People who are, are throwing questions back, but settle down. People who are arguing with each other as a part of worship, settle down. But specifically in a culture where women were interrupting what was going on to ask their husbands questions. And Paul is saying, do that at home. And it's interesting, Jim Dennison notes it this way. He says, it seems clear that Paul wanted the Corinthian women not to disrupt the worship services in which they participated, but to listen receptively to what was being taught. Just like Paul was calling on them to stop competing to see who had the greatest gifts. Just like Paul was saying, hey, go one at a time. Just like Paul was saying, look, there needs to be a limit to what you do. There needs to be some order, some structure to this in the first place. The whole concern here was that they were centering their lives on the truth in a way that was sensible, that was constructive and was helpful. And verse 40 tells what matters most to him. He says, be sure that everything is done properly and in order. You know why he said that? Because they didn't have a clue how. It was a hot mess. Now I've thought about this quite a bit this week, trying to get my head wrapped around that in a way that would help you see how this progresses. And this is the best I can do. For the last three days... My title has been Buddy. My three grandchildren have been at my house. Our kids have been in the Dominican Republic on a mission project. So Kelly and I have had our three grandkids. And um, so we've been dealing in their world. They're six, four, and two. <laughs> yes, man, I'm thinking nap today will be stellar. <laughs> My, my oldest grandson, Corwin, uh, spent his whole little childhood being at home. And then he had a little brother, and so he and his brother were home when COVID hit and everything was shutting down. So Corwin had never had a school experience. The only thing close to that was a Sunday morning at a church. He'd never been in daycare, never been in a preschool. And so last year... He had a shock to his system we call kindergarten. And he showed up and there's this really sweet young teacher that's only, I think, in her third year of teaching. Man, she took him under wing and he had to start learning how to operate in a world of strangers. There are lines and each person has to wait their turn. Everything doesn't belong to you. And everybody doesn't respond to you as the little brother who thinks, I got to do what you want. And if we don't like it, we just fight about it. And everybody isn't a little one-year-old or 18-month little sister who just doesn't have words but has plenty of screams to go with it. He entered into this world with a sweet teacher who taught him how to operate on the playground, in the classroom, at his desk, how to sit up straight, how to wait your turn, all these things. And I knew that things had changed yesterday or day before yesterday. We were sitting at the table having dinner and Corwin starts asking questions. And this is how he does it. Buddy. <laughs> what is that? He asked me about my grandmother. So I said, buddy, buddy, every question. You raise your hand, I'm going... I need to write a thank you note to that kindergarten teacher. <laughs> there are certain things. You give instructions. You, I mean, wow. 
This is the kid that I'd walk in a room and he'd be sitting on a stool in the middle of a living room. Are you in timeout? Yep. (laughs) And in his place is this little kid who understands there are rules and there's a way you do things. And you want to ask a question, you don't just blurt it out, you buddy. And you have to take turns. You have to listen. Remember when he came home? Buddy, this is a book. This is the spine. This is the cover. This is the back cover. This is the table of contents. Wow. Can you read that thing? Yes, sir. Wow. The people of Corinth had been absolutely pagan. I go to the temple, I do this. I do my ritual. You know what? We have people who come to our church every month who are coming out of what we call ritualistic religion. It is all about doing the things in order according to the list. You check it off. You get your religious deal done and then you get back to your life. And typically the conversation at some point winds up going, Bruce, you, you talk about the Bible a lot. This is strange, don't you think? Yeah, I, I do talk about the Bible a lot. And, and you talk about a personal relationship with Jesus. I've never heard that in my whole life. What the heck is that about? And the more I learn, the more I realize that there have been these series of things you do that have nothing to do with loving God. They have everything to do with performing for God. And once that really takes root, over the course of time, you see the light come on. And it's usually followed with a statement kind of like, I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulders. Last week, I got an email on Sunday afternoon. It was a picture of two people who had on shirts like they'd been baptized. And they said, five years ago, we started attending FBC and we planted our lives there and we were part, but we felt lost for so long. And we had lots of conversations, lots of questions because what we were hearing there was so different from what we'd ever experienced. And slowly but surely, we got our questions answered and we started seeing this bigger picture open up that Jesus cares about all of our life. That it's no longer, I get my religious fix so I can get back to my life. It was, I come together with God's people so it climatizes my whole life to him. That's what they were experiencing 2,000 years ago. Because walking with Jesus is completely different. And there was joy and there was power and there was encouragement. But just like my grandson had to go through a process where he had to let go of old habits while he embraced new ones. These new believers in Corinth were having to do the same thing. Leave the pagan cultic activity behind. Adopt a courtesy with each other, serving each other, waiting on each other, expressing patience and bearing with each other because Christ had come to rescue them. It was a whole new life. And the only way that was going to happen would be if they let God lead. And I have a question for you. It's the question. It's the question we've been asking all along. Will you let God lead? The fastest growing religion in the world is the religion of self. Name a continent, name a culture, name a generation. Today, the the ultimate religion of our world is the religion of self. It's my life, I'm in charge, and I choose what is right and wrong, what I will do. Only one problem. If you are your God, then Jesus is not. 
That's why when Jesus had crowds surrounding him, he would stop them in the tracks and say, you want to come after me? Oh, yeah. The first thing is, you must deny yourself for that role. Because if you're leading, he isn't. And there's only one leader. And I'm wondering today, for you, will you let God lead? That's different from saying, I believe God is real. The devil believes God is real. I believe that he died on the cross and rose again. The devil knows that to be true. But it doesn't make the devil follow Jesus. And your knowledge of the truth is not what transforms you. It is the trust in the one about whom the knowledge declares truth. And Jesus will not be an also ran. Either he will lead or you will. Will you let God lead? This morning... This very moment is the most important moment you will spend today. Because now it's time for you to decide. Who will lead your life? You want to talk about that? You have questions? You have struggles with that? We want to provide time. We want to listen to that. But it's still not going to take the place of you making a decision. Every Sunday, we offer you the chance to come by the compass and sit with somebody who is farther along on that journey or where you are trying to, to encourage you in that walk or answer your questions. We gladly do that. Those of you who are watching online, every week we give you this text number. We want to have a conversation with you. It's just as easy to call you across the country or across town as it is to call somebody in their same room. But you are the one that has to decide. And so this morning, I want to do something a little different. And by the way, this is not code for put up your stuff and get ready to leave. I'm going to ask you to pray something this morning. And I'm going to ask you to kind of do an inventory. Because I'm going to bet that there are some areas of your life you'd say, I'm willing to let God lead. And there are others that he wants to lead where you are saying, oh, no, you don't. This is mine. I'm going to ask you, will you do this? So I want to lead us as we pray. I want to help you do some serious praying this morning. Because you got to decide. Will you let him lead? Let's pray. Father, I know that the difficulty of deciding to let you lead is something that has been true since the creation Sin was born out of a desire to have control for ourselves. We have always wanted to be our own God. And so we have chased after every kind of idolatry or every kind of popularity or every kind of religious experience that would still allow us to be the ones calling the shots. But you yourself said as you walk this earth, no one can have two masters. And so today, Father, hear our hearts as we wrestle. Father, some in this room are wrestling about whether they're going to let you lead their morality, how they use their bodies. Some today are wrestling with how they will use their vocation and work. How they'll utilize their resources, whether they'll say it's all about them or they want to be used by you for good. Some are wrestling in relationships because they have already decided what they want and are hesitant to ask what you want. Some have things that they are substituting for you as the center of their lives. Addictions, desires, hungers, 
that they won't even bring to you because they're afraid of losing them. Some, some are struggling about what the future will hold. They feel like they're hanging between the trapezes in midair waiting for you to reveal to them the next step and wondering if they'll trust it when you do. But in all these, in all these, we must choose whether we will lead or we will let you lead. So today, give us courage and faith to believe your heart and your intentions as good. Even when that means saying no to other things that would seek to lead and dominate our lives. And Father, wherever we find that difficulty, a wrestling match, Father, help us to come running to you for the help we need and to be reminded that you bought our lives on the cross with your sacrifice because you loved us. And so because we know you love us, God, help us to love you, to trust you enough to let you lead. That we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, before we go, Michael and I worked through the service this week, and he said, I think I want us to do this song. I was reminded of it this week because they had a dedication of the new elementary school, and they put in the cornerstone. And today, the cornerstone is a symbolic thing, but it has always been a part of the construction, the part that holds everything else together. And we're going to sing about Jesus being the cornerstone. I hope that as we sing, you'll make this the reality of your heart, that you'll lean on him as the one who leads and holds everything together. Let's stand together and sing.
dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone. somebody about what you've heard today right across the hall head to the compass there are people waiting to talk to you if you're watching online you can use those links in the description or send us a text at that number y'all are dismissed have a great day well thanks so much again for joining us we would love to see you in person soon but in the meantime if you have any questions you can text the number on the screen or you can click those same links in the description all right we'll see you guys next week